the wonderful Wizard of Oz, enchanting readers for 100 years, L. Frank Baum. Introduction Folklore, legends, mites, and fairy tales have followed childhood through the ages. For every healthy youngster as a, has a wholesome and instinctive love for stories fantastic, marvelous, and manifestly unreal, the winged fairies of Grimm and Anderson have brought more happiness to, child, to, to childish hearts than all other, other human creations. Yet the old time fairy tale, having served for generations, may now be classed as historical in the children's library, for the time has come for a series of, ne of newer wonder tales in which the stereotyped genie, dwarf and fairy are eliminated, together with all the horrible and blood curdling incidents devised by their others to point a fearsome moral to each tale. Modern education includes morality. Therefore, the modern child seeks only entertainment in its wonder tales and gladly dispenses with all disagreeable incidents. Having this thought in mind, the story of the wonderful Wizard of Oz was written solely to pleasure children of today. It aspires to being a modernized fairy tale in which the wonderment and joy are retained and the heart ages and nightmares are left out. L. Frank Baum Chapter 1 The Sick Law Dorothy lived in the midst of the great Kansas prairies with Uncle Henry, who was a farmer, and Aunt Anne, who was the farmer's wife. Their house was small, for the lumber to build it had to be carried by wagon many, many miles. There were four walls, a floor and a roof, which made one room. And this room contained a rusty-looking cooking stove, a cupboard for the dishes, a table, three or four chairs, and the beds. Uncle Henry and Aunt Anne had a, had a big bed in one corner and Dorothy a little bed in another corner. There was no garret at all and no cellar except a small hole dug in the ground, in the ground called a cyclone cellar where the family could go in case one of those great whirlwinds arose, mighty enough to crush and buildings in its path. It was reached by a trap door in the middle of the floor, from which a ladder led down into the small, dark hall. When Dorothy stood in the doorway and looked around, she could see nothing but the great gray prairie on every side. Not a tree or nor a house broke the broad sweep of flat country that reached the edge of the sky in all directions. The sun had baked the plowed land into a gray mass, with little cracks running through it. Even the, uh, even the grass mass, no, the grass was not green, for the sun had burned the tops of the long blades until they were the same gray color to be seen everywhere. Once the house had been painted, but the, scene, the sun blistered the paint and the rains washed it away. And now the house was as dull and gray as everything else. When Aunt Anne came there to live, she was a young, pretty wife. The sun and the wind and wind had changed her too. They had taken the sparkle from her eyes and left them a sober gray. They had taken the red from her cheeks and lips, and they were gray also. She was thin and gaunt, and never smiled now. When Dorothy was an orphan, first came to her, 
aunt M had been so startled by the child's laughter that she would scream and press her hand upon her heart whenever Dorothy's merry voice reached her ears. And she still looked at the little girl with wonder that she could find anything to laugh at. Uncle Henry never laughed. He worked hard from morning till night and did not know what joy was. He was gray also, from his long beard to his rogue boots. And he looks he looked stern and solemn and rarely spoke. It was Toto that made Dorothy laugh and saved her from growing as gray as her other surroundings. Toto was not gray. He was a little black dog with long silky hair and a small and small black eyes what, that twinkled merrily on either side of his funny wee nose. Toto played all day long, and Dorothy played with him and loved him dearly. Today, however, they were not playing. Uncle Henry sat upon the doorstep and looked anxiously at the sky, which was even grayer than usual. Dorothy stood in the door with Toto in her arms and looked at the sky too. Aunt Anne was wish washing the dishes. From the far north they heard a low wail of the wind and Uncle, Uncle Henry and Dorothy could see where the long grass bowed in waves before the coming storm. The storm. There now came a sharp whistling in the air from the south, and as they turned their eyes, the way the way they saw the ripples in the grass coming from that direction also. Suddenly, Uncle Henry stood up. There's a cyclone coming, Em. He called to his wife. I'll go look after the stock. Then he ran toward the sheds where the cows and horses were, keep, were kept. Aunt Anne dropped her work and came to the door. One glance, to, one glance told her of the danger close at hand. Quick, Dorothy, he, she screamed. Run for the cellar. Toto jumped out of Dorothy's arms and it hid under the bed. And the girl started to get him. Aunt Anne, badly frightened, threw open the trap door in the floor, in the floor, and climbed down the ladder into the small dark hall. Dorothy caught Toto at last and started to follow her aunt. When she was halfway across the room, there came a great shriek from the wind, and the house shook so hard that she lost her footing and so down suddenly upon the floor, the floor. A strange thing then happened. The house whirled around two or three times and rose slowly through the air. Dorothy felt as if she were going up in a balloon. The north and south winds met where the house stood and made it the exact center of the cyclone. In the middle of a cyclone, the air is generally still but the great pressure of the wind on every side of the house raised it, raised it up, higher and higher, until it was at the very top of the cyclone. And there it remained and was carried, miles and miles away, as easily as you could carry a feather. It was very dark, and the wind howled horribly around her. But Dorothy found she was riding quite easily. After the first few words around and one other time when the house tipped badly, she felt as if she were being rocked gently, like a baby in the cradle. Toto did not like it. He ran about the room, no, now here, now there, barking loudly. But Dorothy sat quite still on the floor and waited to see what would happen. Once Toto got too near the open trap door and fell in, and at first the little girl th thought she had lost him, but soon she saw one of his ears sticking up through the hole.
for the strong pressure of the air was keeping him up so that he could not fall. She crept to the hole, caught Toto by the ear and dragged him into the room again. Afterward, close, afterward, afterward, closing the trap door so that no more accidents could happen. Hour, hour after hour passed away, and slowly Dorothy got over her fright. But she felt quite lonely, and the wind shrieked so loudly all about her that she nearly became deaf. At first, she had wondered if she would be dashed to pieces when, she, when the house fell again. But as the hours passed and nothing terrible happened, she stopped worrying and resolved to wait calmly and see what the future would bring. At last, she crawled over the sawing floor to, the, to her bed and lay down upon it and Toto followed and lay be down beside her. In spite of the sawing of the house and the wailing of the wind, Dorothy soon closed her eyes and fell fast asleep. That was the chapter one, chapter two to be continued.